Hello, and welcome to a very special edition of Man Enough. Hi, Jamie Heath. Hi, Liz Plank. Hello. <laughs> oh my goodness, I get to see Liz. Look at Liz. Look how, cute, look how just look like sweet and wonderful. She's got athletic Hello. greens on. We've done ads for them. I She's got these cool glasses. The light follows Liz wherever she is. It really, Aww. that rhymes. So sweet. Jamie, wow. you're the only one who doesn't have a bun. What I know, but I'm the only one that? on the Man Enough set. I'm on the set, by the way. And this is an, a special sure. episode we're doing, so I can tell you both that um, you're both fired. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We're canceled. We've been waiting. It's just been a matter of time. Um, so we're doing a very sweet episode of Man Enough right now where uh, instead of just the normal like recap, New Year's resolution, hashtag, you know, New Year, new me thing, we thought that it would be really nice for us to like have an honest, vulnerable reflection. And we've gotten so much great feedback. We've had so many amazing comments and messages and people reach out to us. We just thought that we would just go in and talk about what it was like to really learn in real time together. You know, we said that early on, that this is going to be a show where we follow our journey and we learn in real time and we're not always going to agree. And we've done that. And here we are going into a new year. And what a perfect time to take a breath and think about everything we've talked about and all the incredible guests that we've had and the lessons that we've learned and the insights and the knowledge that we've gained. Mm -hmm. So with that, mm -hmm. shall we dive in? Let's, let's, do, let's it. do it. Let's go. You know, we've had some amazing, amazing people um, that we've been able to interview and learn from and who have also contributed to the to humanity in so many ways. Um, one of them, my goodness, being Alok. Many of us don't know who we are outside of what we've been told we should be. Trans people, we know who we are. And that's where we're being hunted because we literally chose authenticity in the face of adversity. Yeah. I have to deal with extreme scrutiny of my life everywhere I go. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I know the power of authenticity. And that's what trans people teach men, cis men, is there's nothing more powerful than stepping into your truth. And that's what the healing is gonna take in this world, is if we stop living someone else's fantasy of who we should be, and we actually get intimate with who we actually are. How I think if we said, well, I think if all of us individually, like we're blindfolded and put in a room and said, what's one of your favorite episodes? We'd all say a loke. For Hands sure. Down. I mean, how could For you sure. not? Our listeners and beyond our listeners, I think one of the favorites is a loke. They mm -hmm. are just um, incredible. Why, why, By the way, they, they just, uh, came out with a poetry book what yes yeah they know out. Yes. you got a book oh yeah from a loke i got a book from a loke uh, yeah yeah i want i want one i'm gonna take right. yours <laughs> the majority of people are ready to heal and that's why they repress us as trans and gender variant people because they've done this violence to themselves first They've repressed their own femininity. They've repressed their own gender nonconformity. They've repressed their own ambivalence. They've repressed their own creativity. And so when they see us have the audacity to live a life without compromise, where we say there are no trade-offs, where we say we actually get to carve in the marrow of this earth and create our own goddamn beauty, instead of saying thank you for teaching me another way to live, they try to disappear us because they did that to themselves first. So. I guess I would rephrase your question to be, can you help me get free? Not, can you help me help you? I loved when Alok really just took questions that we presented and gave us like 10 more to think about, right? The constant reframing of, of, of the questions that were being asked of them was a really powerful tool and and I think lesson for any person you know who faces any kind of marginalization in our society uh and their ability to reframe themselves um not as a victim not as a right um as someone who needs to be healed but but sort of asking you what do you need to be healed, right? How do you need to accept yourself if you cannot accept me? Uh, and really asking that, I think, particularly of of, of cisgender men, but uh, you know, all, all all of us. I mean, the the the, the questions were, were were directed to 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 all of us, and mm -hmm. 
yeah, I mean, that just is like one, <laughs> you know, uh, oh, no, parcel so I, 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 of, of just the brilliance of that, of that episode. You know, when you have those moments when you hear something and then it just like clicks in your brain and then it lands in your heart and you like can't unsee it. The focus has been on comprehension, not compassion. So people will say, I don't understand. Why do you need to understand me in order to say that I, sh I shouldn't be experiencing violence? It, there was something about the way they said that, that just like cemented in my heart. Like we think we have to understand something in order to accept it or to mm. love it. And that's not the truth. Mm. It's, the, it's the other way around. And the way they said that, it just, it hit me so hard. And it's been such a gift. And I, I, I requote Alok in so many interviews all the time mm -hmm. um, because they're helping us heal. Mm -hmm. mm. Because that's what, to me, that episode was about. It was about healing. I want to be able to exist. I want to be able to walk outside without being spat on. I want to be able to live and not fear dying. I want to be able to wear what I'm wearing and not be called brave. I want to be able to actually have people regard my humanity, not some one-dimensional trope that they're getting from these racist and transphobic algorithms. And people are saying, that's a threat. <laughs> Darling, the threat is a system that has made you mistake your latent disassociation as a personality. That's the threat. That hit home so much because of my own experiences in life. And then I think like, which person doesn't want their sister or brother or child or parent to not walk? You want them to be able to walk down the street without worrying about your very life. And that was so, it wasn't that it was profound, the concept, we all, we all believe that. But to actually visualize that that is the experience of a person. Mm. Nobody wants that for somebody. It doesn't matter if I understand them or comprehend them. We champion for the dignity of human beings, period. Mm. Uh, I love and that. Is that, that isn't really that the thing? Like, you know, regardless of someone's religious belief that would maybe be anti this person. Yeah. At the core of all religion is love. Love. And if you, if you love something or somebody, you don't mm -hmm. want them to be spat on. You don't want their life mm -hmm. to be in danger, regardless of what their choices are. And if you yeah. personally agree with them, it is antithetical mm -hmm. to the teachings themselves. Mm. And it just shows how much more healing has to happen. And a loc is coming from a place of love too, even yeah. towards that person, right? Uh, if you follow them on social media, you'll even see they their <laughs> responses to those hateful comments are yeah. still coming from love. a place of love and compassion, not uh, a, 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 a place of, you, you know, allowing anyone to, to, to like, I, I think it's a, it's a, feels like a, that feels like a binary too, right? I either forgive um, or, or, or I don't. And I think that they are mm. able to hold both truths at the same time. And I don't think we have a nuanced conversation about forgiveness mm. uh, in our right. country at all. You're listening to the Man Enough Podcast. We'll be right back. And our next partner has a product that I literally use every day. I do start my day every morning with Athletic Greens because I am lazy. Yes, I can remember which supplements I'm supposed to take, which ones are, you know, what what they mean, if I did take it, if I forgot to take it. So with Athletic Greens, I just wake up in the morning, I scoop an entire delicious green powder into a large glass of water and then I've hydrated for the morning and I'm ready to go with all the vitamins that I need. And so what what's in this uh, green powder? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food, sourced superfoods, probiotics and adaptogens to help you start your day right. And this blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, focus, aging, all the things. And we know that with flu season coming up, all right, or I guess we're in it, um, with holiday gatherings, you want your immune system to be fully ready to defend you so that you can just enjoy and be merry. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So all you need to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash man enough. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash man enough to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance.
All right, welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. So often, we just need to be able to hold space for each other. And one of the things yeah. we talk about on this show is what's a safe space for men? It's a space where we don't attack each other. It's a space where we hold each other accountable and through love and understanding and compassion, ask each other to look at some of these areas that maybe we're not looking at. Mm -hmm. Right. From our conversation with Emmanuel Acho. I just, I, I don't second guess me. Yeah, I, let, let you, me, yeah let, you don't seem like somebody that's So talks. let me, um, uh, so forgive me, so I'm just going to challenge you a little bit. Please. All right. So I hear all that, and that's great. What I feel is a little bit of armor on, right? Mm -hmm. A lot. Uh, okay. Take your armor off, bro. I have sacrificed a lot of fun and pleasure and maybe potential joy for the sake of not failing. If y'all really want me to get transparent, the real transparency is I've sacrificed just being free for the sake of not failing. Cause I'm not even lying. I don't really have like a dang, I really I wish I would have done that. There's not a ton. But it's only because I I every move I make, I calculate. I'm like a robot. I, I, I calculate everything. So I'm not really free. The decisions that I make, I've pre-planned 10,000 times over. Do we know what about, happened with Emmanuel Acho after the episode? That Emmanuel Acho. If you're listening to this and you haven't heard that episode, please go back and listen to yeah, it. It's and maybe, it. maybe he'll come back and do a second episode. He um, should come. He said he would. That. He said he would. Him I would and love I, him to and I, know what he's him and I about texted. Since, him and I yeah. texted and sent each other some voice notes after that, by the way. And okay. I, I got to hand it to him. He, he was willing to sit there with us and piece by piece remove his armor that's the hero's journey yeah i mean if you think about it i don't think there was any conversation we've had on this show that modeled the journey of man enough more than emmanuel acho's episode mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he came in with that armor on and i know all of us were a little bit confused because we had a very different show in mind and a ton of questions to ask him mm -hmm. and so we just went with it and uh, intuitively just knew that we couldn't just let this be without going there and by the end of it, he mm. was feeling so different and he, naked, if mm -hmm. you will, which really, yeah. and I talk about this a lot. I talk about, I talk about this in the book, but um, I encourage everybody who's listening to this to read The Knight in Rusty Armor. It's literally Emmanuel's episode. <laughs> um, mm. By the end of it, his armor was off and he felt naked and um, vulnerable. Mm. And he was even questioning himself, which was the opposite of who he was at the beginning of it. When people turn on whatever they turn on to see me, mm. it's to it's to it's to put on a show. And I just I don't feel enough. Like I just I just I, I don't I don't like the feeling. That's probably why so many men stay away from feeling because then we don't feel enough and we're not uncomfortable with it. We don't know what to do with that. I don't like it. I, yeah. I like I like I like rocking with confidence. They also when I walked in here, I'm like I'm, I like I like walking with confidence. But I'm just like you're still being confident. Bro. Yeah, this Something. is more to me. This is more confident than how you came in. You feel m way more confident than the guy that walked in. I because you're here. I feel like doubtful. Mm, I, I I feel doubt. It's what we do. I feel like I feel unsure. Welcome to being human. Welcome to being human, exactly. <laughs> you know, I was nervous that he was going to be mad at me or... I know, remember. They, I remember. Yeah. I was nervous. I was like, ah, because I'm a people pleaser at the end of the day and I have my own insecurities. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I remember we got an email from his publicist that mm -hmm. said, Emmanuel was really grateful for that conversation. It challenged him and it made him think. To and me, then I knew right so then good. that dude's the real deal. The real deal. Mm -hmm. And I was super yeah. impressed by how you both challenged him. Um, and, mm. and I let you lead in that way because mm. I, again, I, I think I knew if it's that it needed to come from the yeah. both of but you. But that is our, and uh, that is than, our role. Yes. Right. Yes. Like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a woman's job to try to, yes. to try to, to try to take the armor yes. off a man. And, and truthfully yes. for anybody listening, this is what that episode reflected is very much the relationship that Jamie and I and our small yeah. group of male friends have with each other. What you witnessed that's, was that's how true. we hold each other accountable and challenge each other mm -hmm. in private. So in mm -hmm. many ways, Jamie and I were like, oh, we get a chance. 
we're gonna we're gonna do this here with you oh, okay <laughs> yeah I, in, in terms of my biases i think that one thing that i've really learned this year i think that there are just certain things that i just don't know because mm. i am not a man i've not been mm. raised in the masculine culture um i've only been an observer of it and obviously also a uh, like victim of it from from my own end of, of, of being a woman but i have i have not like had that experience and so no matter how many day how much data i read no matter how much research i do no matter how many interviews i conduct like there are certain things that are just kind of like up to you and um not up to me to necessarily not only you know have the answer for but but also i think comment on and that was one of my favorite episodes because i think it was the most honest and real in terms of why we started doing this work that's what that episode reflected and i really hope that yeah. um people stuck around and listened to the whole thing yeah indeed loved um so you had mentioned like why we do this um, has this been a successful year thus far? Mm -hmm. We set out to do something um, that we weren't sure exactly what we were getting into other than we knew we wanted to touch the hearts of people. And um, and yet we're doing work that's not always so popular. Um, <laughs> what, you makes you, what makes you feel that way? <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking like patriarchal idea of success? Are we competing with Joe Rogan for numbers? No. Specifically, as a man, I'm fed the illusion that more success equals more happiness. Of course. That's And it's an illusion. That's spot on. Eugenio Derbez. When my kids were little, I tried to, I was just thinking about being successful, about, about being a provider. I was working all the time uh, and I never gave them time. Mm. And I think that's the most important thing you can give to a kid. Mm. Time, quality time. Rain Wilson. I think we inherit it. There's societal pressures about what makes success. I mean, there was a very long period of my life that the entirety of my self-esteem, I'm talking about all of it, yeah. was uh, my success in work. If things were going well in work, then I felt good about myself. Mm -hmm. If things were going bad in work, then I felt bad about myself. Mm -hmm. So if it's been a long part of this therapeutic process. It's been a long kind of untangling uh, that matthew mcconaughey i think it's a word that we all need to unpack yeah what's our world tell us is successful now i'm not for filling your bank account at the expense of your soul's account for me success has always been is there a person out there who depends on us who has had their perspective change whose life has changed is there a couple who has gotten together stayed together is there a man who's entered therapy Mm -hmm. That is success. From our conversation with Russell Dickerson. Absolutely, I believe in therapy. That's been a huge asset to us. Uh, we when we were in quarantine, you know, we we hopped on Zoom with our counselor and did marriage marriage counseling right there. Mm. And uh, absolutely believe in counseling. You believe in yeah. therapy, which I love. I can't wait yes. for your next album, and I would love to hear the the, the song about therapy. That would be awesome. <laughs> That's men in therapy. It could be funny. I can I can just whip a song up real quick right now. Yolo Akili Robinson. What? Do you want me to talk about my feelings? You want me to go to a doctor and experience something vulnerable? If I haven't received a message that has taught me to not to do something counter to that, I'm going to internalize that and keep that going. Cure Gaines. I can't figure everything out. I can't be omnipresent. I can't always see everything. And my therapist helps me with that. Therapy is also a lot of work. And it's a lot of opening doors that your mind has purposely kept shut. I don't want to know what's in that closet. What's going to fall out of there? <laughs> what am I going to have to change that I'm not comfortable with? Sam Baldoni. We just push things back because we don't know how to approach certain things. And I think that today, the therapy that we've all been going through has been helping us give us tools. These are tools that you can learn um, that I never had access to and I never even thought about it because I always thought that I was fine. And Justin, I am so curious because you uh, you had two very intimate e episodes with your dad and with, with uh, Emily, your <laughs> wife. So what happened after those episodes? How did, did mm. those episodes sort of change anything um, for those relationships? Well, first of all, those, I feel so damn lucky that I got to have my dad on the show. 
for years, I just wanted a dad. I didn't want a business partner. I didn't want to talk about work. I just wanted my daddy. And I think that's something that a lot of men experience. Us being together and me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. That 10 year old. I just feel like a little boy. Yeah. Because sometimes as a man, I still feel like a boy. And I don't have anywhere to go. And I don't want to put that on my wife. I don't want it to be my wife's job to make me feel like a man. And while I still have you here, thank God I do. I'm so privileged at 37 to have you here. I don't want to spend the next however many years like not feeling close to you. There's a difference between feeling close to you in proximity and feeling close to you um, emotionally. And that's what I desire. And if I can do that and if I can model that for my kid, then that's all I want. I want my kids to feel close to me. I love you. <laughs> you too, Daddy. I love you, son. I, mm. I got so many, uh, you know, men who told me, like, I, I, I was bawling my eyes out during that. Like, that was such a special moment, I think, for both of us. Um, and you know, look, it's, it's, it's a tiny part of the conversation, right? Um, but the fact that he was willing, that I have a father who's willing to sit in that seat, he just shows me that it's never too late. This whole idea of mm -hmm. you can't teach an old dog new tricks is bullshit. And my dad's defying all of that. Um, and we've just been getting closer and it's really, really sweet. And yeah, no, it makes me emotional even thinking about it. Um, and I'm just feeling so damn, so damn grateful. And with my wife, um, you know, I don't know if I've been more proud uh, as a mm. as a partner than like getting a chance to hear my wife just say things that I think millions of women just felt like she was speaking for them. I, I work with so many women that just that are new mothers that don't they don't they are so let down by the patriarchy and society today and it is heartbreaking because these women fathers too but mainly the mothers, they are raising the next generation, which is a big fucking job. Excuse my French. The most massive job you could ever imagine. Like, I know no woman speaks for all women, but I cannot believe how many women have come forward saying, like, she speaks for me. And that felt like a conversation that I wish my man could hear. And how many women are sharing that with the men in their lives, being like, what she says is what I feel and not having that space to share. And and I just like, I remember sitting in that episode and thinking to myself, like, I don't know what I did to deserve this, but I can't believe you're my wife. What about you, Jamie? One of the things I got to experience recently is do something that I had not done before. And that's from our conversations about um, how to demonstrate to our next generations how to be better than what we are. On an episode we did on me, I spoke about my journey in my life. When I was um, around seven, I was molested. Then it happened again when I was around 10, and that lasted for four years or so. I never thought I was molested. I just thought um, I was engaged in activity with another man. <clears throat> then I got around 15 years old, and then I started uh, um, spending time with a woman that was uh, 30 years old, at 15, 16 years old, and being engaged in sexual activity. And I thought it was cool. Um, after about two years, that lasted. Then I started having relationships and I was never faithful to anybody, to any woman. Blew my marriage up um, by um, being unfaithful to my marriage multiple times, multiple people. Infiltrated a friend's marriage. Mm. I don't want to conflate my choices with abuse and my childhood trauma because that is abuse when you when you hurt someone like that recently um i have been shamed i will leave names out but by some individuals that were um, a part of that history in my life <sighs> um who sent me horrible um very the worst. hurt hurtful messages to me um and it made me feel really angry, gaslit for talking about my childhood and what happened to me. And then 
I was in a lot of pain. Um, Justin was one who was here for me during this this time, as was my wife and a couple others. I have I don't think I've ever seen somebody go through literally being gaslit, handle it with such grace. Like he went through the gamut of all the feelings and he allowed himself to feel, which is not something that we do as men. He allowed himself to cry and break down and feel rage and anger and all of the things and still in his heart found love and compassion. What's crazy, I'm sorry to go on about this. This is what's crazy. This is what happens in our world is along the whole way, I've done everything I can to protect those that hurt me. I just think of how many people have to do, go through that. How many times, Liz, that you have been gaslit for feelings that you feel, and then you have to protect and worry about family members or friends of family members and all this to protect others instead of being able to someone just say, I'm sorry, I hear you, be accountable. Uh, but what I got to do as a parent is when my son, who's 18, saw me debilitated for five days, I couldn't move. Mm. Um, I was frozen because this is what happens. It makes me angry for women who have been oppressed for years and years and years and nobody believes them and no one listens to them and then we victimize them and then we make them go on a stand to prove it. And then when it happens, the person that hurts them, there's no accountability to them and all the stuff. Like this just happens over and over and over again. But with my children, they got to ask me what's wrong. And I got to tell them. I didn't tell them the details that you need to know. I got to tell them your dad's in a lot of pain because someone's not being very kind to me and they weren't kind to me when I was younger for re and now I'm they're not being kind now and it's making me very sad and they got to like process it with me and I'd have to pretend that I was some man that was too macho to be vulnerable um I don't know if I would have done that before our podcast um before our conversations seeing other people being willing to be vulnerable hearing stuff from you Liz more than I've probably expressed to you how much you've uh had a big impact on me as I know I've stated that, but maybe not why. And to, to anybody listening, um, our heart goes out to you if you've been in a similar situation. And that's why we're doing this show. Is that's right. And that's why I say it so that it's not about me. I'm not saying it for my own protection. I'm saying it for yeah. all of our listeners who, who relate to your experience, Justin and yours, mm -hmm. Liz and mine in different ways that to not feel that just because you ruffle some feathers along the way by doing your truth mm -hmm. and doing the work, um, to not be discouraged yeah. by it. Yeah. yeah. From our conversation with Jay Shetty. There's a beautiful statement by Russell Barkley where he said that people who need the most love often ask for it in the most unloving ways. And I think what it means to be man enough is to be able to approach everyone with that love, recognizing that the pain they're causing you or anyone else is coming from a place of them being unloved at some point in their life. Karamo Brown. Broken crayons can still color. Mm. And I thought about all the things that have broken me as a man, that have made me feel like I had to be a certain way, act a certain way, um, that I realized that even though I felt broken, I can still color in this, I can still color this world magically in a beautiful, vulnerable way. Things have been rough, I've done wrong, but I can still color and make things beautiful again mm. um, for myself and for others. When was the last time that you apologized to someone? Oh, every day. Every day. Love that. Um, I, I like, I think, I think it's important to, if there's ever an action that I think or assume could have hurt somebody, to apologize immediately. It, it is this admission because I think so many times as men, we're afraid to admit the parts of ourselves that we need to heal from and grow through to be better for ourselves and for our families. I'm always telling my, my kids, it's a joke, but I'm always telling them, don't make the same mistakes because, I, and what about you, dad? I, I made all these mistakes just to show you <laughs> what you shouldn't do. So, <laughs> only for that reason. I sacrificed myself, I ruined my life for you, just to be an example for what not to do in life. <laughs> So we've, we've just had so many amazing conversations. I feel like all of them I could say are my favorite. Um, How about if we did like quick some rapid fire about like guests like Keir Gaines, Glennon Doyle, Dr. Joy DeGruy. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Keir? 
I think it's a cultural piece. Sometimes you can't be what you don't see. Mm-hmm. We're coming off of the hills two generations back where per, I, I don't, can't tell you my grandfather changed the diaper. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you my grandfather sat down and looked his wife in the eye and said, hey, what's going on? You're becoming your own yeah. role model. Yeah, right? yeah, you had to become yeah. the man that you didn't have. Especially if you want to find a male role model that kind of exudes all of these great principles that are expected of men in today's society. I think of Kier. I think role model. Role model. I think daughter. Mm. How much he loves his daughter, what he does for his daughter. I love it. I think he has fun, right? Mm. Like Kier, to your point, Justin, create, created a role model that he didn't see. Um, and, and uh, but he has so much fun doing it too. There's such a mm. joie de vivre, like it's so joy. playful and yeah, joy. it's so, it joy. How about Glennon? Men are good and, and, and human and, 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 and love. But masculinity is this cage, right? So, so it's so important to me to think like it is none of this is women versus men. It's. It's men and women and non-binary people and all genders and between gender and beyond gender against gender conditioning. Yeah. Beautiful. All of us together. Such a badass. <laughs> badass. Oh my gosh. Such fan a badass. Boy. Fanboying, fanboying mm-hmm. over Glenn. I think, yeah. Fairy I think she set the tone. I think she, yeah, because she was one true. of our, our beginnings, First. she really kind mm-hmm. of helped set the tone of where we went. She um, helped me find my own voice on this podcast. There's so many messages that I, you know, obviously took on for my everyday life. And she, again, continued. She went on the Ellen show recently. No makeup, right? She just does these things that are so bold and so, so, um, yeah, just like gutsy. Joy DeGruy, Dr. Joy DeGruy. I asked black people in general, males and females, I said, what does respect mean to you? And it was so different. They said, it's my worth. It's my value. It's, I mean, it was so much further below the epidermis. Mm-hmm. So now let's go back to that question. What does respect mean? Go, quick, quick. Oof. Data Church. queen. Data queen. <laughs> Another badass. Church and data queen. You don't usually felt... find both those things in one person. <laughs> this idea of respect and how important that is. Respect literally means, taken from the Latin, Spect is where we get the word spectacle. To see or to look. Re is again. Look again. That's what it means to respect. Please look at me again. Please, just look at me. That's what they were asking. Look at me the way you see your own son, in your own world. My goodness, can you look again? And maybe if you look again, maybe you'll see my humanity. I just remember hearing that and going, oh my Oh my God. Mm-hmm. I also want to give a special shout out to my friend, Sean Mendez for coming on. I mean, Sean is so vulnerable and open mm-hmm. and honest, like just with no fear and just and to acknowledge some imperfect parts of himself. It, it's really manly to mess up in front of people and be corrected. It's really manly to say the wrong thing and sit there through that uncomfort and admit you're wrong and then grow. That's like the manliest thing in the world because nothing shakes my core more than being corrected and having to sit there, mm. take one of those, mm-hmm. and then and then keep having that conversation. Mm. But it was how he always came back to truth. Mm-hmm. Like everything, like he didn't try and virtue signal or pretend like he knew everything or say the right thing. I get caught in that. I want people yeah. to think I'm a good person. I want people to think I'm a good ally or whatever, right? And then we had amazing, like Andy Grammer being willing to sit in that seat. I think there's a how duality. Do I, how do I do that? That both are true. When she says, just fucking do the laundry, you gotta be able to hear that mm-hmm. and not run away in defensiveness or think that it emasculates you to a place that you just can't mm-hmm. hear. I also think when you talk about masculinity, what, we're, what, what you're trying to get to is what is this thing that guides our lives? Yeah. What is this? Yeah. You know? And uh, I don't know if I'm the best one to tell you that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That conversation with Andy Grammer really shifted something in me. And mm. I swear, for the last, I th- feel like it's eight months, um, 
I have I've been making like a crazy conscious effort to do extra things around the house, regardless of whether I have time or don't have time and find joy in it. Mm. And it's been, oh my God, I'm going to cry. It's been really sweet because I feel like I've missed it. Like I've, like I've, like I'm, I'm almost, I'm mad at the fucking patriarchy for telling me that I didn't have to do it because when I fold my kids clothes, like appreciating them wearing them mm. right it's been such a, a journey for me to like do the dishes and find that oh my god i'm meditating right now like I, this is a meditation i'm moving i'm doing the dishes and i'm meditating and i'm thinking and it's making me joyful and the house is clean and nobody else has to do it and i'm taking the burden off of somebody else this is my mess why didn't i clean it up before um so it's been a huge huge impact in my life and mm. um and I know my family's life. And uh, and yeah, so the, the, so I was just so grateful. Hmm. It's beautiful, That's Jay. Beautiful. That Thanks, was brother. beautiful. That's such a beautiful reframing, right? Of mm. chores, right? And taking something that might feel not only like whatever, but that's been denigrated or devalued because honestly, it's something that women do uh, and making it sacred and using it as a way to um, show your self-respect, to show respect to the people that you love and show them love, right? Yeah. Um, but to, co so, to connect. So beautiful. It's, yeah. like, it's been like a way to yes. connect. Right. Which is, which is, which is, it's just, it makes life so much sweeter, you know, mm. life is about connection and then we're so disconnected from so many things. And for many mm. of us men, we're disconnected from all the invisible work that goes in to making our lives sustainable. That's where those typical gender roles really begin to hurt us because I feel our men are not brought up really understanding the the role of the mother. I don't blame men for that. I, I, I just blame the system. I blame the patriarchy. Little Rel Howry. He went downstairs and we ain't never seen his man cry before. So you never seen your dad cry? Never seen him cry before. He put her jacket on instead of his and he could smell her scent. Uh, and he just, but we never seen him cry. And we didn't even know what to do with that actually. Mm. In that moment also I realized my mom was all of our emotional vulnerable connect. Mm. So that's what we all would be vulnerable around at our own time. So when she was gone, wow. we didn't know what to do with those emotions, mm. actually. Should we share some fun stories? <clears throat> what are some what are some things that were, I don't know, really inspirational or moving or fun or do, do we want to talk about stuff that people don't know about? Tell Fancy us. details of our private lives. <laughs> FaceTimes where we help each other breathe. Uh, and Justin <laughs> watches me cry um, several times mm. and then uh, helps me do breathing and then checks on me uh, and makes sure that I did it again and that I took a cold shower and that I'm doing it in the right order. I um, downloaded this app, the Wim Hof app because <laughs> of Justin and now have recommended it to so many different men because you're right, it's very... It's changed the advice that I give to to men and and in terms of mental health and even again the way that I approach my mental health. Uh, I think an overtly very traditional feminine way of doing it is like talk about your feelings and just feel your feelings and like yes, but also breathe and and like alkalize and just like there's some things that can and took a really cold shower that's really painful so have, and you, wait, have, have you actually have done the effect. cold have you been doing i did everything you, you told me to do I, I i did everything you told me so for some backstory and, by the way by the way i just so everybody knows what this is not this is not like a thing that I'm not Liz's coach. Like we this is not a thing where that where the I'm like, do this, Liz, jump in the cold shower. No. There were the, there have been moments where we have been there for each other and Liz has been there for me emotionally. Um mm -hmm. but there was one particular moment where our, as your friend I felt that would be helpful only because I just went through a similar thing of anxiety. Mm. So what wait, so you jumped in the cold shower? 
I did it. No, so I, don't, I was trying to I was trying to remember what I was upset about. Yeah, and I thought it was like my booster vaccine. Like I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> it's like it must be, you know. And you were like, you sound like you're having a panic attack. I was like, oh, that makes that makes sense. Only because I had just only because I had just had one the week before, and I was coming out of it, and we were both experiencing very similar symptoms, and I didn't even yeah. And I and I learned actually through this journey as I've been going deeper into my own healing mm-hmm. that I've had anxiety and bouts of depression and and many panic attacks for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I was just I told as a man that that didn't exist and just powered through it. From our conversation with Anthony Padilla. I had a painful awakening uh, in my early 20s where I had my first panic attack and I try to control my breathing. Uh, I try to become very present, think about the area that I'm in, the feelings that I'm feeling, the whatever I'm touching, the air that I'm breathing. And being present in the moment makes me then not fear what's coming next. I love too that we spent some time on discussing themes like mental health. Anthony Padilla, mm-hmm. Jay Shetty did. Just the idea of allowing yourself to have some compassion for yourself. Mm. And I think everyone who's sitting out there who's judging themselves Accept that you judge yourself, be compassionate, but then seek to redirect that energy. Jason Wilson yeah. talked about this. I get home, sit in the living room, <clears throat> and uh, my, my wife says, you don't seem to be too okay. I says, I'm not. I said, I just went through a lot and I need a moment to release. Hmm. And so my, I have a concept I created in Battle Cry where you reflect, release, reset, so you can rest. They call it the four R's. Karin Brar. I started experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety at 13. Um, and at first I kept pushing off getting help because I was like, oh, this is situational. Medication um, contributed to to saving my life. Elja Jackson the third. If me speaking about what happened to me and you speaking about what happened to you give someone else the courage to speak out about what they're going through hopefully they can get the support that they need to begin the road to healing sooner than i did because i didn't start my healing until i was serving a life sentence in california mm-hmm. Wisdom K. It's weird. Like I'm really confident in terms of, in terms of like what I'm wearing, mm. but in terms of the more like physical aspects of myself, not so much. Oftentimes I find myself I'll look in the I have like a full body mirror, you know. Sometimes it's my arch nemesis. Sometimes it's my best friend. Giacomo. Oh, oh Giacomo. yeah. I know. Loved. Loved. Yeah. It's, it's therapy. It's psychiatric evaluation. Mm. It's diet, exercise, sleep. Uh, a good relationship with. Um, you know, work and making sure that you're not overworking yourself. These are all things that are triggers that can that can make you relapse and have episodes of mania or depression. Um, so, and like autism, it's a spectrum. You know, no no case is unique. So, one I could have ten people in a row who are bipolar. Their their experiences are completely different from each other. You know, this guy. Oh, when I don't sleep, this sets me off. Or this. Oh no, I can not sleep, but when I don't do this, it sets me off. Or whatever. So, um, but I think it's, I could easily say it's probably the most gratifying, you know, pillar milestone I've reached in my career was to be able to portray something that connected with so many people Mm. and and to feel that love back. Um, Mm. And that people felt seen or felt heard or felt like they had now some kind of extra tool to serve them in helping a family member, you Mm. know, or helping Mm. themselves. We got every guy to kind of talk about mental health, health. which Everyone, is, yeah. uh, in itself pretty radical. Hey, Liz, yeah. what, what's your thoughts on some of the guests mm-hmm. we've had that have really spoken to community building and the advocacy of those that oftentimes um, could use a voice? Um, mm-hmm. you know, what's your perspective and what are your takeaways from any of this? I mean, plus one to what Justin said about Sean Mendez. I, I really actually quote that interview a lot in my day, in, in, in sort of my daily life. Um, he talked about the importance of truth. And to me, that is at the root of community, mm. right? The root of community is not, um, are you good enough? <laughs> are you man enough? Are you right? Like whatever enough. Um, it's about acceptance and it's mm. about inclusion. It's about the truth. 
<laughs> and and I just think if more people were able to relate to each other in a way that is um, fully true to, to 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 who they are, I I think we'd have a lot less issues. Mm. Really. And it is brave. It's brave to be vulnerable to like to confront these things. Like it is bravery. And it's like the amount I have to breathe into this conversation to be able to just let it flow, mm. to be able to, to speak the truth, to be able to be okay with what I've already said. It came basically, it came about because I wanted to give boys what I longed for. Just a man who would encourage them without condemning them in the areas of their lives where they feel weak and then build them up to where they're strong. That's why it's imperative for me. You can't heal a child by re-traumatizing them. What we do in Circle is we don't just sit with men. We sit with anybody who's willing to look at where they're screwed up. Mm. The predominant monks that I lived with were all men and service was at the core of their entire being. So our teachers would always tell us that the only way a culture succeeds is if everyone wants to serve everyone else. Mm. And so that was like the encouragement of that culture. And that's where it became so real to me. And for me, service and masculinity go hand in hand, but service and humanity go hand in hand. When you were saying to me that I have the superpower, what I want to tell you that superpower is community. You're allowed to be vulnerable and vulnerability is the basis of community. And so you're allowed to actually say, I need help. And under patriarchal gender binary, men aren't allowed to need help. Men have to be all knowing, all self-serving. You're allowed to say, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm ignorant. And that is where beautiful relationships are created. They're not created from being all knowing, perfect sculptures, Adonises. They're created from being like, hey, I don't know. Can you help me? And there's many things I don't know. Can you help me? And that's how we built interdependent community. So maybe the superpower is just interdependence. And it comes back to our conversations with a Alok, right? Being fully who you are uh, means that you can see other people be fully who they are, right? If you are comfortable with yourself, uh, you're not bothered by someone walking down the street, you know, uh, transgressing whatever social norms around gender that, that mm -hmm. were made up at the time. And, and mm -hmm. Alok really spoke to this idea, too, which I think is at the root of community. Are you fighting for um for for yourself are you fighting for power or are you fighting for freedom and again that's a really great thing to come back to when we are building community like what are we fighting for and i think it's easy to you know it happens to be that you get misaligned for whatever reason but i think it's a really good thing to come back to really good statement to think about oh that's what they said that stuck with me yeah. this idea that are we fighting for privilege privilege yeah. Mm. Are we fighting for freedom? And I for never freedom. thought of it that way. As, as someone who sits at the top of that privileged uh, intersection of power, that food chain, right, as a straight, white, cisgendered male, um, it's so it's just something that I've never thought of. Mm -hmm. So it's so cool to see you, Liz, kind of like embody that. I love hearing you talk about that truth, Liz. I just love it. I have been extremely touched by a lot of the feedback about the podcast. And I know you have too. We did that live, which where everyone was crying yeah. um, with, with, with listeners who have been touched. I had to take that step to be able to be a better, better man for her. That's my biggest fear that I'll make the same mistakes that he did. No, you're not your father. And I just got engaged three weeks before he passed away. And she has a wonderful daughter, seven years old. And now I'm stepping into that role and I'm just afraid that I'm gonna make the same mistakes. And let me tell you this much too. The way that you live your life moving forward also repairs the stuff that your father did in the past. That's how this stuff works. You get to change his legacy by the way that you live. It's changed their relationship with their father. It's changed the way that they raise their boys or even their girls, right? And kids of any gender. Recently, I got a comment saying, this is the podcast that got me and my husband that like saved our marriage and got mm -hmm. my husband interested in doing therapy. And that makes me so happy. That just makes my heart complete. Can I share a quick story with you? Recently, a friend of mine was driving home from a prison. She does prison work, prison reform. She has students that go to UCLA. On the way home, I called her. She was in a car full of students that were like undergrads or actually maybe, you know, postgrad. In any case, as I was bantering with her, one of the students asked when we hung up, 
who was that you were talking to? That person sounds fun. They were like being crazy. She said, oh, it's my friend Jamie. He's a musician, does this. He's president of Wayfair Studios. He does this podcast called Man Enough. And she's like, I know who Jamie is, Jamie Heath. Justin Baldoni, Liz Plank. <laughs> and, and my friend Claudia says, oh, you, you know the podcast? She was like, I live on that podcast. That podcast in a lot of ways is like saved my life. So she says, hold on, let's call Jamie back right now so you can hear right from her. So she goes on to share with me how, uh, mm, how much our podcast has meant to her, how she's been in like the darkest period of her life and how the topics and themes um, have meant so much to her. And specifically because she is for reformative justice and believes in humanity, mm -hmm. that our conversations has helped with that whole process. So what I learned, and then she went on, just just a lot of love gushing of how much this meant to her. I learned later, after talking to her, that she was one of the people in the synagogue a couple years ago that happened in Long Beach when a person came in and shot the place up and she witnessed her mother die in front of her. And the dark place she was speaking of was this recovering from this very horrific event. Um, and she went on to say how much the podcast has meant to her. She's, she still believes in reformative justice, even the person that killed her mother, that mm -hmm. she still believes in humanity and believes that even those people still deserve um, something different than what the systems are in place now. And when she went on to say how just how much the podcast and mentor and some of our sharings really moved me, um, made me sad for her, of course, but also to hear her joy in what she was doing and how much she shared and maybe a little bit that what Liz, you have offered and the work that you've done and Justin knew how much you've cared and maybe a little bit of what I've been able to share. So um, I don't do this often, um, but, and we don't have to use this as an episode, but I just want to say her name. And I want to say hello, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. And we want to say how much um, it's meant to us to know that our podcast has meant a little bit in your life and that you are in our prayers mm -hmm. and we love you. And you are going to be a kick-ass rock star in this world um, because of what your journey is and what you care about mm -hmm. and where you're dedicating your life to. Um, so the Man Enough podcast wants to give you our love. Um, mm. Yeah, that uh, made us cry. Hannah, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, so we're just going to read a few um, few public posts here, posts that were made about our podcast, um, which are really sweet. Because, yes, we've talked about the things that we've learned, our challenges, but it's so great to celebrate the good. And I just want to end this episode on us celebrating some of the good that uh, that this podcast has done that have come from, I think, our collective vulnerability. So this particular post is from a woman named Margarita Rodriguez, and she wrote on YouTube, I need you all to know that watching this conversation is healing for the rest of us who cannot have those conversations yet or ever. I love how Justin describes that each generation is trying to do better. Thank you for letting us see your tears. I appreciate this podcast so much. Mm. Oh, that's sweet. You got another Beautiful. one? Beautiful. Thank you, Margarita. So after watching therapist, influencer, proud husband, and father, Kier Gaines, Juan Galvin posted on our YouTube, lately I have been feeling lost, been working on myself and wanting to be better, but it is hard when making a mistake and feeling I'm still not the best version of myself. Thank you for this. It truly helps to remind myself that I am enough and it is okay to make mistakes and continue learning. We love that so much. Mm, Juan, yes. I love it. Amazing. Look forward to the next mi mistake. Make better mistakes tomorrow <laughs> is my yes. That's right. whole motto. All right, we got um, one from, I'm not sure who this came from, Stefan Kelly. After Jamie's, my episode, Stephen Kelly commented, thank you for teaching us how to start making spaces safe, not only by words, but by showing us what one looks like. 
Jamie, that was an amazing display of vulnerability and personal accountability. A great example for others. This is a great episode to see where you are all at with the work you are doing so that we all know that there will be days like today that are uncomfortable. But in that discomfort is where the work gets done. Amen to that. That is where the work gets done. Um, Stefan or Stephen, I'm sorry. I don't know how I would say your name. Thanks for sharing that with us. And um, I appreciate you, brother. I think that was I think that was really beautiful. Okay. So, guys, this has been so amazing to, to see you guys. It is a pleasure and honor to do this with you. I'm so glad to Same. see you. Um, Thank you. I can't wait till we, we get back together in person and get to do some more episodes. But in the meantime, thanks for today. And to, to any of you who are listening and who've made it this far, uh, be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself, and remember that who you are, as you are, is enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And this is Man Enough. Man Enough! Mm -hmm.